Good afternoon to everybody. We are tuning in to one of our uh, events uh, in the framework of the Greek presidency for the Council of Europe. Joining me is uh, the Yale professor, Nicholas Christakis, who is one of the um, persons we are all paying attention to over those uh, days of coronavirus for his analysis and predictions. But before we um, proceed with our discussion, with our one-on-one, -on -one, we are um, ready to uh, hear from the alternate Minister of Foreign Affairs, Mr. Miltiades Barbiciotis. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the series In Discussion With. Uh, this series has been produced and put together by the Greek Chairmanship of the Committee of Ministers of the Council of Europe. And during our chairmanship, we try to tackle the issue of rule of law, democracy, and human rights in times of pandemic. Actually, we are trying to bring together institutions and personalities to answer to many questions posed by this pandemic. This unprecedented decision that the global community has undertaken to put uh, human life first, to put the right to access uh, to health as a prerequisite for the go on and of course to undermine at the same time the economic activity poses new challenges both at the personal but also at an institutional and educational level. Today it's an honor to host a friend of Europe, Mr. Nicholas Christakis, who is the Sterling Professor of Social and Natural Sciences, Internal Medicine and Biomedical Engineering at Yale University. Professor Christakis is an authority in social networks and biosocial science. His participation is extremely timely as we have entered the second wave of the pandemic. And regardless of the good news, that uh, we have heard in the front in combating this pandemic. Nevertheless, throughout Europe, nowadays, we face a new season of lockdown. Connection and contagion are two key themes in his research. And his work has significant uh, implications for policy, as well for new technology and online networks. Professor Christakis has already spoken with good words about the way Greece have dealt with the pandemic at its first wave, and he can help us understand the challenges, but also the potential path to follow in the next mass, both in the US and in Europe. We are proud that so many different personalities came to talk to us. And actually, they have contributed in putting together what we have presented last week in our 130th uh, ministerial meeting and uh, is called the Athens Declaration, which is a document that actually brings together the challenges that we're facing at the epidemiological field and the challenges we are facing at the political field and how we can combine human rights, democracy, and rule of law in fighting this pandemic. This document, we hope that it's going to be our heritage, our chairmanship's heritage to the next generations where they are going to be faced with a new pandemic in the future. Until then, I want to thank uh, George Evgenidis from uh, Sky Television that he hit is making this uh, interview possible uh, for us and I'm waiting uh, as you are waiting to listen to Professor Christakis. I hope you enjoy the show. Nicholas, thank you very much for taking the time to be with us. Um, I would just um, like to start by the, new, by the news we have from Pfizer. We meet at a time when Pfizer announced that it's only a matter of time to have a safe and effective vaccine against coronavirus. Is this um, a glimmer of hope, a sign for a return to normality in the coming weeks and months? 
Yes, of course, it's good news. Uh, but you have to understand that scientists fully expected that we would have a successful vaccine or, or several vaccines discovered sometime in the, in the near future. But it's not just a question of discovering a vaccine. We also have to manufacture and distribute it and persuade very large numbers of people, millions of people, to take the vaccine. And those steps will take additional time. So I suspect it'll be between, it'll be until 2022, some approximately, before we really begin to get some relief from this pandemic because of the vaccine. Do you see a, a great hardship? Do you see obstacles in this effort to get people along, to convince people all across the globe to get the vaccine? Yes, of course. This is a, a classic problem, uh, is, is persuading people to, to use the vaccine. First of all, just to back up a moment, this particular vaccine, the Pfizer vaccine, requires a very cold, cold chain. The cold chain is where when you distribute the vaccine, the vaccine has to be kept at very low temperature, I think below minus 80 in this case. Uh, yeah, and, so it's also a matter of facilities. Yes, you need special trucks, special refrigerators, and the vaccine can never be hot. You know, it can never warm up to room temperature. So this is itself a very difficult challenge. But even if we surpass that challenge, then we have the challenge as we're, as we're discussing of getting persuading people to accept the vaccine. And here, this is why credibility on the part of political leaders is so important. Because if political leaders have been honest with people, have been honest about the risks, honest about the uncertainty, honest about their own ignorance, or honest about their, their optimism, all along the way, when the time comes to, pers to, to attempt to persuade people to take the vaccine, those figures will be seen as more credible and will be believed. So you see, effective leadership in a time of a pandemic, one of the pillars of, of effective leadership is, is transparent, frequent, and honest communication that doesn't, mm -hmm. that doesn't sugarcoat things, you know, that says, that is that says this is a difficult challenge. This is this is what we know. This is what we don't know, and so on. Uh, this is very interesting, and you also touch upon a key element, a key parameter of uh, democracies, which is trust. So, where is this bottom line, where there is a fragmentation in trust vis-a-vis -vis not only leaderships but also the scientific community? We see many people challenging scientific judgment, which should not be the case, honestly. Well, scientists, of course, challenge each other. That's the nature of the scientific process. And this is why I yep. said it's important to communicate uncertainty. Uh, so so it is, science is, you see, self-correcting, right? So what is your evidence for a case? Oh, here's my evidence. Oh, well, here's counter evidence. How do we, now what do we do? You know, do we reject the original position? Do we revise the original position? Uh, this is the nature of science. And so this is why it's important for scientists, of course, to be humble and careful in what they say, and for political leaders to be careful as well. But for both parties, what's important is communicating the evidence for a claim. So if politicians come forward and say, this vaccine works, mm -hmm. they should also tell the public, and here's what we know, here's why we believe it works, here's, here's the, concept, the risks of the vaccine, and here's the uncertainty. And you see, this requires also maturity on the part of the public, right? democracies, people get the governments they deserve. You know, they get the governments sure. they vote for. If there you want, there needs to be maturity on both ways, on, on both sides of, of uh, yeah. Yes, that is right. So the, 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 the governments, so if people want to elect leaders that lie to them, they will elect leaders that lie to them. And, and we might, and always you see in the time of plagues, lies mm -hmm. and denial follow right behind the germ. So the germ is spreading through social networks and lies and denial are spreading through social networks. All the way back in the plague of Athens in 430 BC, in, in the bubonic plagues that afflicted Europe during the, the mid medieval times, you know, always in times of plague, there is our lies and denial because people would wish, people wish that this was not happening to them. So they have superstitions yeah. and so on. But we expect more of our leaders, right? We do not in an ideal world, we do not expect our leaders to lie to us. So I think the public has to be willing to accept the harsh truth. They have to elect leaders who will make science-based decisions and communicate good news and bad news. And then the society has to work together to confront this, 
this changed world. Let me just but say but one since, other thing. Since, sorry, sorry. Since we are discussing this challenge, just give me a bit more insight on how we can cope with fake news or partially accurate news. We as journalists, politicians, uh, as elected officials, how do we respond to those claiming, for instance, that this virus is something very similar to a casual flu and practically there is so much fuzz for no reason? Well, I think you could, if, if someone is making that claim, you could ask them what is their evidence for that claim. And then uh, it's, it's harder journalism, then you have to either unpack that evidence or look at the evidence on the other side. And you can either, you can either on your own, the ideal world is the journalist makes some decision about, you know, if someone said the, the sun rises, you know, in the West, you know, you would not report that. I mean, unless you were reporting that they were, you know, that they were crazy. Uh, so, so I know it's difficult and I know it requires subtlety from the public, from journalists, from scientists. It also requires scientists to be restrained and say, here's what I believe. Here's why I believe it. Here's my evidence. Here's my degree of certainty. Of course, these don't make for good stories, right? It's much easier to report, you know, hydroxychloroquine is a miracle cure. Everyone gets excited. There's no evidence for that claim. Uh, you know, it's just fantasy. Um, so, so anyway, so I think that is very important. And I think people, you know, people should, should themselves be careful, you know, should exercise judgment in, in what information they transmit. And it requires all of us mm -hmm. to do this. Now, of course, people are scared. And when, and when people are scared, they're more, you know, their, their judgment is compromised. Um, so it yeah. is a complicated challenge. And then, again, th but this is, I think, what goes back to leadership. You know, I think that effective leadership uh, gets up and says, you know, here's what I know, here's why I believe it, here's the, my degree of confidence in what I'm telling you. And, uh, you know, I had previously made a mistake. Uh, two months ago, I told you this thing. I told it to you because of these reasons. But now I'm changing my statement for these other reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to go back also. Are, I, I want to go yeah. back also to the trial because you. We opened this conversation by saying that the Pfizer trial is good news. I think we need to be careful in what we say. The interim results suggest that it's good news. We don't have the final results yet, and we only have right. interim results on efficacy. We don't really know about safety. We don't know how mm -hmm. safe this drug is, and unfortunately. Even with trials, the Pfizer trial has 43,000 people. Even with trials of that size, uh, safety problems with vaccines are often extremely rare. Let's say one in 100,000 people. Most get a, have a serious complication from a vaccine. Uh, I'm sorry. Let me, let's edit this out. Yeah. Um, so most vaccines, just to be clear, have a safety profile of only one in a million or only one in... Uh, uh, 10 million people have a serious complication of the vaccine. But I'm concerned that in our rush to develop coronavirus vaccines, we might have safety that's lower. Let's say one in 100,000 people has a problem. And in a trial of 43,000 people, we might not find such a problem. So, mm -hmm. so we will have to wait till the vaccine is being used by millions of people before we know about the safety. So the Pfizer trial so far, there's strong evidence that the the vaccine is effective, soon we will know for sure, but we still don't know how safe it is. And we also don't know a number of other things that are very important. So it's, I don't want people to just think, oh, miracle cure. For instance, we know that the drug, the vaccine stops people from developing symptoms, but we don't know if it stops death. Maybe the vaccine has no effect on mortality. Uh, and we also don't know if, uh, if the vaccine affects infectiousness, maybe it prevents people from getting the disease, but it doesn't prevent them very much from transmitting the disease. Yeah. These are all important subtleties. And I recognize that the average person on the street isn't interested in such a long conversation. <laughs> but, but if you just read the headline, you know, vaccine works, there's a lot more underneath that that people need to think about. Yeah. Uh, so... In your initial response, you made this prediction about the return to normality, which will take some more time. Do you think societies will get back to where they were? Will we ever return to the status quo ante? 
Well, first of all, even when we have widespread adoption of a vaccine, it's still going to take time for us to recover because just look at the economic devastation from this pandemic. Uh, many businesses have gone out of business. Many people have lost their their jobs. Uh, you know, there's a lot of um, a lot of um, of economic uh, problems that have arisen and that will take time to unwind, and social problems as well, and psychological problems, and 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 there'll be clinical problems too. Maybe five percent of people with COVID will have long-term disability. So there'll be millions of Europeans and Americans and Asians uh, and Africans uh, with disability as a result of these infections. And so all of these things will also continue to affect us. So I think it'll be about 2024 before we begin to return complete, you know, more or less to normal. And this is also typical of past pandemics. So if you look at a previous serious epidemic disease around the world and across history, it takes a while for people to recover from the epidemiological shock and then the economic and social shock. Mm -hmm. In your most recent book, Apollo's Arrow, you discuss the potential implications of the pandemic. Give us a synopsis of these. Where will this pandemic leave us and how will it reshape societies and needs within a society? Well, there may, <laughs> there, it's hard to give a short answer to that question because yeah. I think there'll be a range of um, implications and uh, it, it'll also be sensitive to the nature of the society beforehand. So I think medical care will be affected. We'll have much more online um, uh, provision of medical care. People will have gotten used to it. The systems will work. Business travel will be affected, the hospitality industry. I, I think the days when people fly across Europe for a one hour meeting, uh, you know, are over. Now, I, I'm not saying that, I mean, face-to-face -face meetings are hugely important and will continue, and transacting business face-to-face -face is extremely important. But I think many routine meetings, you know, will now be taken remotely. Be because people, yes, exactly. And so that'll have implications. I think um, I think there'll be implications in education. And, and uh, you know, every country organizes its educational system differently. But, for example, at the college level, I think there there'll be more online courses, for instance. I think there will be um, there'll be there may be some changes, at least in the United States. Let me give you the example in the United States, in in uh, in labor market participation in women, and hence in gender relations. So, for example, in the United States, it's still the case that most households are heterosexual couples. Of mm -hmm. course, there are homosexual couples, there are single you know single head of household families, and so on. But if we take the sort of stereotypic heterosexual couple, uh, typically still in the United States, the man earns more than women on average. And also typically still in the United States, women prefer to uh, spend time with their children and, uh, and then compared to men. So when the, when the economic impact of this pandemic struck the United States, many households and schools closed, for example, and people lost their jobs, Many households said, okay, the man will continue to participate in the labor market and the women will stay home with the children. So that's every family is entitled to make its own decisions. And but if you aggregate up those decisions, millions of households have made this decision. And as a result, at the end of the pandemic, we may find women's labor market participation greatly reduced, setting us back maybe 10 or 20 years. So so this might be for a while. A, an impact, for example, on the on on, uh, on the labor markets and gender uh, amongst uh, on you social know. interaction. Well, also in social interaction. So, for example, you know, in the nineteen eighteen pandemic, uh, it was very common at that time to have something called spittoons, which were little buckets you would spit into when you went into a restaurant, for example. Now, already by nineteen eighteen, these were very unpopular because of the tuberculosis epidemics. There was already a movement to get rid of them because they were unsanitary, but um, but um, <laughs> but with the 1918 epidemic, everyone wanted to get rid of these. There was a huge push, and after the epidemic ended, they never came back. I mean, I've never walked into a restaurant in my life where there's a bucket for people to spit in, and nobody misses them. So, so like that, for instance, there may be other customs we have. For instance, shaking hands may become less popular. Uh, after, now where no one is shaking hands or hugging, you know, um, so, so maybe this will reduce, for instance. Hmm. You know, many societies around the world, 
greet each other without shaking hands. You know, many Asian societies, they bow, people, you know, make this uh, uh, sort of symbol. Uh, so shaking hands is culturally specified and maybe will change. That's interesting. Will something positive remain out of this pandemic? Uh, for instance, you, you briefly mentioned the new way of working or attending school or college. Will this have a positive uh, connotation in the end? Um, I think there may be positive things that come out of the epidemic, but I, it's hard for me to argue that there certainly won't be net positives. Uh, and I think that, you know, um, a covenants for international cooperation may may be strengthened. You know, something like a, like like climate change, for example, epidemic or pandemic disease is a global threat that crosses borders, and it does require some some institutions that um, facilitate international collaboration and and reporting. Uh, the the Chinese were very slow initially to report data accurately, but then very quickly uh, took charge of the situation, and. Um, you know, I think we could just and 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 so there's that. There's international travel. You know, I think is a is an issue. So I think there will be some some positive impacts. I think I think one possible potential positive impact. Of course, this sounds very self serving, but a greater respect for science. Uh, you know, I think that the person people on the street generally respect science, but unless they, it tells they pretty much know what they were doing specifically. Correct, but they also t tend not to like it when scientists tell them unpleasant truths, you know, inconvenient truths. And I think, um, but you know, if you if you have a scientist saying, "Here's what's going to happen with the epidemic if we do X or if we do Y," and then the the person on the street observes that, sees that that's actually what happened, that may increase the credibility of and the believability of of expert opinion. Now. Of course, experts can be wrong, right? We need to acknowledge that. But I think that the, the conversation around science may change for the better after the pandemic and incidentally may help us as we fight climate change. You know, climate yeah. change has very similar economic and geopolitical features compared to the pandemic, but very different temporal um, horizon, right? So the pandemic is over weeks, months, and a few years. The the climate change is over years and decades, right? And so it's very easy to ignore predictions about the climate in a way that it's not so easy to ignore predictions about the germ. Yeah, but if you're seeing that actual predictions do work and do make sense, then you might get a different grip of it. I would also like to ask, are those conspiracy theories we discussed previously against the virus also a new driver uh, of populism across the globe. I was reading, for instance, that Nigel Farage in the United Kingdom is reshaping his Brexit party into a party that fights against lockdowns. So shall we expect a new front, a, a new international of deniers of the virus? Well, it's kind of hard to deny the virus, honestly. I mean, you have to really delude yourself to deny the virus. I mean, you could debate whether a country should or should not take a particular policy. But we know now that the virus kills about one, through many scientific and detailed scientific studies, that the virus kills about 1% of the people that it infects. So it's, it's not as bad as smallpox or cholera, uh, or it's not as bad as smallpox or cholera or the bubonic plague, thank God, because it could have been. There's no reason the virus only kills 1% of the people it infects. But 1% of people is a, is a pretty serious virus. That's 10 times more deadly than the flu. And, um, and we also know that it's pretty transmissible now. We know that the so-called R0- exactly the problem, the, the, the high transmission rate. Yes, well, that's one of the problems. There are many problems. This virus is a very sneaky virus, actually. And um, so we know that the so-called R0, the R sub zero is about three, 2.6 to three approximately. So that means for every case you get in a naturally interacting population, you get about three new cases, let's say. That's pretty contagious. So it's a bad virus and it's out there. Millions of people have it and it's never gonna go away. So there can be people that wish to, there could be people that debate what we should do about it, right? But to, to argue that the virus is nothing to worry about is, is ignorance. And uh, so, so this man is a dangerous man, actually. He is harming our society and he's harming political discourse. And there are many such dangerous figures around the world, uh, including the president of the United States, who you know, has been basically 
saying lies, I mean, outright falsehoods uh, for months. And we, and, and we now know that, in, that he actually had been briefed about these things back in, in December, in January even. And so this was almost a willful, a willful uh, lying, which is, you know, unacceptable uh, in our leaders. And this was uh, my next question as well, because, you know, I cannot help but ask about the election of Joe Biden. He has pledged to draft a comprehensive plan for the management of the virus. And uh, he started by appointing a new task force to work on this plan. Will Biden, sorry, would Biden have won without the pandemic? And will Biden be a better manager, both in terms of health care, but also in terms of the economic recovery plan? I mean, Biden is being handed an awful um, situation. I mean, uh, the uh, Larry Summers, the former uh, Secretary of Treasury and a colleague of his, David Cutler, a professor at Harvard and a friend of mine, both of these men, uh, published a paper recently calling this virus the $16 trillion virus. $8 trillion. These are enormous sums uh, of economic uh, hardship and $8 trillion of health, uh, uh, death, disability, and illness. So the, the virus is, is, a, is an external shock to our economy, the likes of which I think we've never seen uh, to the United States economy and, and also, therefore, to the world economy. So it's, it is a, a really serious uh, problem that we are facing. Biden is inheriting this, and it was poorly managed. So, so first of all, even if Trump had managed it well, it would still be a problem. But it was very poorly managed by this administration, certainly on the epidemiological front, where we've had many needless deaths. And, uh, and also, and on the messaging front, you know, there's loss of trust in institutions. And also on the economic front, in my view, the United States was completely unprepared. China shut down its country on January 24th. 930 million people were put under home confinement. So the Chinese clearly thought this virus was very serious. They, in essence, detonated a social nuclear weapon to stop the virus. That's how bad they thought it was. So what were we Europeans or we Americans thinking? I mean, why, why would the Chinese be, have done this and, and we would think the virus wouldn't come to us? So Italy was then stunned, you know, in February when they were devastated. And the United States was stunned in March. But the United States, it did not take that time to prepare. And so we were very unprepared. So all of these are, are legitimate demerits, problems with the prior administration, all of which Biden inherits. But I have no doubt that Joe Biden will do a vastly superior job in managing the uh, econ econ economic impact, which was still severe, and also the, the epidemic itself. I know many of the people that he has appointed to senior positions to cope with this personally, and they are first-rate scientists and have a lot of experience. So I have great confidence that, that, the, epidemi that the epidemic will be managed effectively. Keep in mind, by the time he is inaugurated, perhaps 400,000 Americans will have died of the epidemic. So right now, it's about 230 or 240,000 known cases. But if you use the another metric of excess deaths, we probably have 300,000 excess deaths, 300,000 deaths overall. And that number is going up every day by at least 1,000. And we are, the second wave is upon us and in us and in Europe. And that second wave will be as bad as perhaps worse than the first wave. So we're going to have a lot of death between now and January 20th. Yeah. Um, speaking of the second wave and coming to the towards the end of uh, this discussion, here in Greece, we have just entered the second full lockdown. We do not exactly know how long it's going to last. It's predicted to last until the end of November um, in an effort to tame this second wave and give you know the, the healthcare system some valuable breath. Judging from a distance, was it a right call? And how difficult is it in general for leaders to meet such a decision which under different circumstances might have been unimaginable in terms of social and economic costs? I think that, uh, as I've discussed elsewhere, you don't necessarily need to implement a lockdown, but if you don't do a lockdown, you need to do many other steps. So you have to think of us fighting the virus as having lines of defense. We have testing, we have physical distancing, we have masking, we can close schools, we can restrict travel, 
We can have better hygiene. Uh, we can um, uh, have a quarantining and contact tracing. So each of these is unpleasant. And, and we don't want to do any of these things, but we have to do several of them. And it's possible that if you did three or four things very well, you might not necessarily require people to stay at home. So consider, for example, South Korea or Taiwan. Uh, those countries don't have lockdowns, but everyone wears a mask. Everyone keeps physical distancing. They have tremendous amounts of testing and tremendous amounts of contact tracing, right? So they have many they other interventions. level of discipline in those civilizations, let's say. Yes, but every culture can do different things. So Greece was very effective in the response to the first wave by adopting you know, uh, school closures and, and banning gatherings. And, and Prime Minister Mitsotakis, in my view, acted very wisely and quickly. Now, of course, they could look across the Adriatic at what was happening in Italy. So I'm sure the Greeks were like, oh my goodness, you know, look what's happening there. We better act swiftly. So, so, but I, so, so the, the point is, is that lockdowns are, of course, the most extreme thing that we can do if the public were willing and able to do not just one other thing. You can't replace lockdowns with mask wearing, but if you did several other things, it might be possible to avoid a lockdown. In any case, something significant constraints, unfortunately, need to be accepted if people wish to avoid death. We could have a conversation where people said, you know what, we don't care, let the epidemic rip. But I suspect that once that started to happen, people would change their minds. And by then it, it would, would be, be too late then. Too late. Yeah. Nicolas, thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for this discussion. All the best. Thank you so much, George. Thank you for having me.